Welcome to our interview series, We Choose to Thrive, brought to you by Becky Norwood of The Woman I Love. We bring you stories of survivors who have chosen to heal, to thrive. If you are an abuse survivor and are starting or continuing your healing journey, these stories will provide hope, inspiration, and a knowingness that you are not alone. Join us in today's interview. Welcome, Jane Powers, to our We Choose to Thrive series. I am really thrilled that you're here. Me too. Me Very too. happy that, that, that we're having this opportunity to talk. Um, would you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you, um, a little story of your past, and then we'll go from there. All right, sounds good. Well, I am Jane Powers, and, you know, it, tell a little bit about me. I don't know if I can stop it a little bit, but I'll tell you what I feel is the most, what are the most important things about me. Number one, I guess what I like to tell people are, it's what are my values, what do I stand for? And my first value is to stand up. Second one is speak up, and third is play full out, because I had lived a life of silence. I like to call it my silent scream life. I had no voice. I had no power. I had no idea of who I was or how I showed up in the world. Once I decided to do that, again, you can't stop me from speaking up and standing up and really playing full out. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Chicago. I grew up the youngest of seven. And very complicated family, as many of you probably can completely understand and relate to. And I have, I have been an athlete all my life. That's what got me through most of my childhood. And I would this be the best time, Maggie? Just tell a little bit about my history. Please do. Yep. All right. So I started out. Um, I guess I could tell you my career actually started in the prison. From there, it went to the drug and alcohol treatment centers. And then I worked in the community doing sexual abuse prevention. And I tell you about my career because it's so absolutely key on how I have gotten to where I am today. So I started working in the prison. There were rapists. There were murderers. There were violators. There were individuals, men, young men, I should say, 12 to 21 and a half, that violated others. And I believe for my healing, I went to work with these individuals to either rehabilitate them or lock them up for good. So I was working through my issues of my childhood through my career, and many people do that. Many people do that. Then I went to the drug and alcohol treatment centers. In 1976, when I was a young girl, my mother actually passed away from alcoholism. So my next mission was to save the alcoholic mothers so they don't have kids like me that just constantly are, are waiting for their mom to come home. Right. Going, they'll never come home. From there, I went and I did uh, worked in the community with juvenile delinquents, sexual abuse survivors, once again, healing me. And you'll see many of the things that we do in our life is based on our own need for nurturing and healing and that oneness that we seek. So part of my career was just a, a reflection. All the while, I was coming up with memories and ah, just tragic stuff that I could not, some days I couldn't function. And I'll share a couple of tips that, that helped me get through some of that. Um, but anyhow, I was a counselor for individuals who had been sexually abused anywhere from kindergarten up to adults. And I was working the front lines because, once again, I needed to heal me. And so to give you my, my history, and, you know, I always find it ironic. You know, we sm I'm smiling when I'm like, oh, man, I had a tragic childhood. And I think that's the key for me is the healing that I've, I've worked my way through. It doesn't have that, that impact or that trigger that it used to have. Many years ago, if I talked about this, it would, it would tear me apart. You would go inside of yourself and cringe. It just kind of like like that blanket that goes over the top of you. Yeah, and what happens because other, otherwise, oh, here was really key, and I'll tell you, part of my, in my work when I was doing counseling for sexual abuse survivors um, and interventions, I mean, I was blowing families up like crazy, reporting, you know, dads, parents, cousins, brothers, sisters. So I was in the front line, and I was, I was taking names. I mean, I was changing how the world allowed individuals to be sexually abused. And what I did for a while is I went to, they had me um, a professor that was teaching social workers how to counsel individuals that had been survivors of sexual abuse. 
So I would go in and I would teach them about me. I would teach them what I had gone through. I had taught them some of the healing that I had gone through so that they could prepare to be able to work with survivors of sexual abuse. But here's what's key. This was in 19, oh, I don't even want to tell you. <laughs> early on. It was early on. Late 80s, early 90s. And I would go in and very matter-of-factly share my history. What I know now or knew quite soon after that was I had a, I had a very dissociative style, not a dissociative disorder, but a style to where I could be here reporting the tragedy and the feelings were over here. So I was able to put on, you know, flex my muscles, be like, yeah, it's all right, I made it through all that, where inside it was like vulnerable and raw. And you were, you put on the tough girl front. Yeah, that was my, that was my survivor. And, I, and you can't tell here, but I'm short. I'm like, I'm, if I'm five, four and a half, I'm exaggerating, but I'm about five, four and a half. And I'm a little thing, but man, I acted like I was 10 feet tall. I could take on the world because I needed to. And quite frankly, I knew how to. It, it, fight or flight, I was a fight. So I was always ready to fight. So my history, I had been sexually abused from the age of zero all the way up to a about uh, right after my mother died when I was 14, my father, thank God, finally decided he was going to have girlfriends outside the home, and he had a number of girlfriends, which saved me at about the age of 15 when my abuse stopped. Ironically enough, I kept looking for my father. I kept looking for the replacement and found a teacher and was molested by a teacher for two and a half years who was a you know, older man that replaced my father. So patterns, habits, and our training, my training specifically was love was about the secret, the anonymous, the dirtier, the, the more, you know, just the, the deeper secret to it. That's what my definition of love was. So right. working my way out of that. But my abuse was by my father. Um, I've got three older brothers. One was a very violent, um, not to get into all the details, but he was not the... He, he was not the gentlest of perpetrators. And then uh, my grandfather and brother-in-laws and, um, you know, uncles. So it was, my family had zero borders. There were no boundaries. There was no limits. And we all survived in different ways. And again, I have never been addicted. I've never been on meds. I've never been suicidal. I The only thing I probably did that's classic survivor is, um, self-mutilation, but I did it through sports. I played football, ice hockey, everything to just pulverize my body because it was so much easier to go, man, this bruise hurts than my heart hurts. Mm -hmm. right. so there's so many ways that we express, and I've been doing, as you know, I've been doing work with survivors for many, many years, and it is my passion to show and be the new way of surviving because I believe there's such a new way and my philosophy is we don't have to do the architectural the you know the archaeological dig and you know resalt the wounds we need to have a kind glance acknowledge and then do an architectural design and Becky uh, one more thing I'd like to share um, I happen to have most every memory that has happened to me. I mean, I have details. My journaling was through drawing and, and writing, but mostly through drawing. And I would like to say many people don't have memories. I, I totally get that because yeah. that's, a, that's um, very common. I've interviewed a lot of women and the memories, yeah. they just like, I can't, I can't come up with anything. They yeah. just know. You know. and, and, right, and that that is validity. That is valid. And I've got three sisters. I've got three older sisters. And the one above me keeps asking me, was I? And I'm like, it's not my place to acknowledge that. The one above me goes, she doesn't remember anything in her life in childhood. And my older, the oldest sister, you know, she's come up with some memories around my brother. So it, it's, it, it really varies. And our system can only handle so much in my opinion, and I believe when our system is ready, for me, I, I needed the facts. I needed to know, and boy, you got to be careful what you wish for because I had, my memories started coming through nightmares of cats, which was interesting, and um, I started to analyze every single thing. 
But I remember when I was like eight years old where I decided I just wasn't going to remember anymore, you know? Yeah. You know, and, and it's ironic that there's a lot of times with just everyday things in life that I don't remember details. Just because you, you form a pattern of not remembering. Yes, yes. And it was in the writing of my book that a lot of those things kind of finally kind of, oh, so you, you rewrite your story when you finally sit down and just face the issues. Right, right. And, and I, you know, I have a lot of people that come to me still, and I work with a number of, and I have a number of clients that I work with that have, are survivors. And, you know, it's, it's just interesting how, you know, the way that I, I think I, um, you know, I had a lot of the classic symptoms, as we would say, you know, I, I, think I was never promiscuous. And it's interesting. I mean, promiscuous. I was, you know, being molested by a teacher. Um, but I was. Ne I think my mother, before she died, very strict. I mean, they, you did not think outside of anything but her rules. And I thank God for that because that would have been something that I could have easily been triggered by to go out. And you know, my friends always were saying, "Aren't you sexually active?" I'm like, "No." I'm like, "I'm not doing it till I get married." <laughs> and you know, it, that thank goodness. That I had some so much fear, you know. I never did heavy drugs of any sort because I did not want to be out of control. My life was enough out of control. Right. I remember what triggered my my healing was I had been going and doing life as I would say as a victim because I had a lot of the triggers still raw and and you know showing up in my life. And I was in college, and I was in a relationship where I was being physically abused. I mean, you know, beaten, knocked out. And it got to the point where I could not stand it anymore. And I remember I, I had just been, you know, knocked around and I got up and I was in my dorm room. I had a, you know, single dorm room and I put my fist through a window and that window shattered. And thank God no one was below the window, but I stopped and I thought, I need to get some help. I need to find out what is making me so crazy inside that I cannot, I can't live with myself. And I started immediately in therapy. And what we kept dealing with was the, uh, was my mother's drinking, was the alcoholism. And then it progressed. I don't know if you've ever, I can't think of the name of the therapy, but it's, um, it's role play re reenactment therapy. Right. Well, I was the viewer and I was watching the family dynamic and my therapist must have known because she started putting that in and I, that's when all the memories started just flooding my life. So it has been, and it's not easy. Oh, oh, I wanted to tell this tip. <laughs> it's a great tip. Yeah, you'll find I'm very excitable. Um, here's a great tip. When I started having memories, now I was still working in the field of sexual abuse prevention interventions. And I had to be on my A game. And I literally, I was in my early 30s. I mean, I was late 20s, early 30s. And I was having memories, and they would just tear me apart. So what I did was when I was going to work, and I worked with kids, I would drive to work, and literally, I would stop off at a daycare center. I would drive by a daycare center right around from my work. I would drop my two wounded kids off to go and be cared for during the day so the adult me could go to work because I could not function as my kid at work. So I, I do a number of little brain uh, tricks, I guess, that help me to separate or helped me to separate some of the, the woundedness and the raw with the adult me that had to show up for work every day. So uh -huh. it, it was brilliant. I mean, it was just some brilliant tricks that I used. Um, I highly recommend people get uh, teddy bears that they can name of each one of their inner child. I still, to this day, since 1980-something, I have my same Savannah, a white bear, that sits on my bed, and I sleep with her every single night because the memory, the cellular makeup of our system, it takes a while to change. It does. It really so. does because it goes so deeply. It does. Absolutely. What a fascinating story. And I just so love your spunkiness because when I f first met you and listened to you speak, I was like, wow, what a leader and what an example. You've done um, things that are just many of us have never walked that way, you know. Yeah, and, and, and as you know, and it's funny, I put my necklace on because it's a, a puzzle piece and it has P-E-A-C-E. -E. 
And my book that I'm writing is Revealing the Missing Peace. And it's a double entendre between the peace of us and the peace in us. Mm-hmm. And I, my goal, my goal is that it's going to be the quintessential book for survivors that are able to say, I don't have to do it the hard way. I can do it the effective way. And, and I want to use a number of tools that I have, I've established and others have established to really help individuals. And trust me, I'll be on the speaking circuit worldwide speaking on how do you do life differently? How do you connect with yourself, with spirit, with life, so that we don't have to be wounded? And here's the other thing. Oh, I'll tell you one thing I did. I was years ago when when I decided I wanted to confront my father. I thought, well, first I was going to confront my brother. I'm like, that's it. I'm confronting him. So I mentioned it to my other brother. Well, everybody found out. Long story short, death threats, <laughs> yada, yada. I disappeared from my family because there were death threats from my brother. And then I remembered about my father. And I thought, oh, my God, the whole the whole clan is involved. So I disappeared. I ended up, I decided when I was ready to find my voice, when I was ready to stand up against what my memories and what everything had, what I had been taught, I went on the Oprah Winfrey show. And <laughs> yeah, I thought, why not? They panned on me and said every single individual has been a survivor of sexual abuse and they're here to make a difference. And there's my face. Well, my family, almost every member of the family has seen that. <laughs> what a blessing. What a blessing because I, at that point, I confronted my father, my brother, my everybody in my family, and I was determined to stop the madness. And I made sure that my nieces and nephews knew that their grandfather and everybody else was a perpetrator and to make sure that we changed the cycle of this family. You and are amazing. Thank you. It was scary as hell. So don't oh, yeah. think you're going to be like, I'm going to go confront everybody. Oh, it is no. scary. And it takes, it takes the process of where you're at. The bigger process, I really, this was my, the biggest transformation I ever had was the F word. And it was forgiveness because that to me, I thought there is no way, no way given everything that has been done to me, I could never forgive. I will never forgive. And that's a a, a really incredible story how I worked through some forgiveness. Amazing. Forgiveness, if you can't forgive, then you did the forgiveness for yourself. Yeah, and, you know, for me, people would say, you know, people would say that to me. They're like, Jane, you know, you'll forgive for yourself. I'm like, screw that. Uh-uh. I'm not letting anybody off the hook. And and they say, well, forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. And I wanted to hold that grudge. I wanted that. I wanted my father and every perpetrator to suffer. And I found the real freedom. And it was a really, someday I'll tell you the whole story. It was a really interesting sequence of events that brought me to the forgiveness phase. And one of the biggest rules that I used was once I can hear something about my father or brothers or whomever else, once I could hear something about them that I I went, oh, good for them, I had arrived. Because every time I'd hear, oh, you know, Ron, that's what I called, I would call my dad years, for years, his first name, well, Ron is going to see the grandkids. I'd be like, wow, you know, I'd be mad and all upset. Right. And at one point, I think I read something, you know, oh, he's going to Disney with the grandkids. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. I'm like, oh, my God, I think I, I did hate it. <laughs> I hate it. And I'm telling you, my life expanded for me when I did not have an attachment to the outcome of his life. Right. Or the outcome thing. of how I thought it should be. But I'll tell you, that is for individuals who are just at the beginning phases Forgiveness right now, and my this is my advice, say screw it. <laughs> well, be bad. You have to be ready for it yeah. because because there can be actually if if you're not ready for it and you try to do it prematurely, you don't get the healing that you really have to have, really need. And you re victimize yourself, in my opinion. You re victimize right. yourself. I did mm-hmm. it too quickly and I went back for the holidays to see my family. And I'm telling you, I triggered right back into a, a submissive, not that I did it, but it was inside. I still put, put my shoulders up and was tough, but inside, 
I was re-victimizing myself all over again. And when I decided, I'm going to tell you, the, the only thing, the only thing that saves our lives is our voice. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. And I'll tell you, I said to my father years and years ago, when I was going through all the healing, I said, here's the deal. You're around me. I'm going to tell you exactly how it is as I feel it. And he said, okay. I mean, what a champion in that because I would come up, I'd trigger something, and I'd go, you know what, you SOB, you stole my childhood, and I would just rip into him, and he'd go, I hear it, because I taught him how to listen to me. And he'd say, I hear that, and I am sorry. I mean, to hear those words out of his mouth, even though he didn't remember anything that he did, well, he claims he didn't, um, hmm. he, he still was able to listen till the day that man died. I would rip on him and I would, you know, express myself and he would hear me very healing. I mean, it was really healing for me. I would um, imagine but, that's huge. Yeah. Our voice, our voice, I, I always say, find your voice, find your power because many individuals are living a life of secret. And here's what's really, I'm going to get off on a tangent. What's really important I think is how we live out and how we play out our roles of a survivor. And I'm going to give you a couple of my philosophy around this, which is really going to be a heavy emphasis in my book. Because number one, we get it. Drugs, alcohol, chemicals. That's one symptom or, you know, promiscuity, all these different things. But I'm going to tell you, there's a couple of different things that really stand out. Number one, our shame and guilt. Uh -huh. Somehow it was our fault. You know, we all hear that. But the worst is, oh my gosh, there's a part of me that actually thinks I liked it. That was the hardest thing for me to admit. Yes. But when I kept seeking the same pattern, it's not that we go, oh, that was so awesome. It's the only thing we knew. It's the only thing we knew. The only thing we knew. We were trained. We were trained. This was the worst thing one of the therapists said about my dad. He grew his own. I mean, he did. He had seven children. You know, my, my belief was, or knowing, was he abused everybody. Mm -hmm. He didn't discriminate. He abused everybody. And, and That's what my experience was. Yeah. And, and the shame, the shame that we feel, like most people, if I say who has been sexually abused in this room, you and I are probably the only two that would raise our hands. Yeah, but you could tell, because I've become very discerning, you can look across the audience and know which ones. Yeah, but, but most. But no, most, not many are going to raise their hand. Not many are going to because there's a level of shame and self-blame. Mm -hmm. The other thing I am real, I'm doing so much re research on this. This has been my study for the last year is many people stay in a, a compromised relationship. We're, we're not getting our needs met. We're, we're not sexually active in our relationships. We may be sexually act active outside the relationship or we get triggered by someone that becomes temptation or there's polyamorous, there's so many different things that I see individuals who have been abused have a number of different issues, including me, around intimacy and affection and their sexual uh, relations. And it's, that's going to be something because it's so key. And that is one more compounded shame that many survivors carry. It's so complex, I can't even put it into words. Yes, I, I, I totally relate to that. And that was probably one of the hardest things that before I could actually speak my truth, that was the reason, because I felt so ashamed of myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was wrong with us. Yeah, and I found a graphic where it's a girl in sunglasses and it, they're painted on the, on the lenses and one is the shame they don't know, the shame they don't see. Mm -hmm. and, and and that is every person I've talked to on with our We Choose to Thrive series, that's the first thing that we talk about is it's always comes up in the conversation is the shame. Yeah. And I, I believe I believe it becomes our shame of today, not our shame of yesterday. There there is when you're going through your first phase of healing, there's a lot of shame and dirty and guilt and all the stuff that is not ours, but we adopt it because perpetrators are keen. They'll help us adopt their stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got it. I'll, I'll carry that as well. And, and then we internalize everything. But I believe that then the, as you work through this, then the shame becomes your current present day actions, activities, feelings, and, 
and I, uh, this is really personal about me now that we've got, you know, we've got people that will be listening. I, years ago, because I really fight it for, over the years for monogamy. I mean, that is something that was very hard for me because I was trained, you know, otherwise. And I had a number of thoughts that were not faithful. And I went to SAA, uh, Sex Addicts Anonymous. And I was not sexually active. I wasn't doing anything. And I would go to the meetings, and they're telling me all this stuff they do, and I'm like, I don't do anything. I think it. My thoughts were torturing me more than the actions, I believe, because mm -hmm. I wasn't acting on anything, but my thoughts were torturing me. And I believe, as survivors, we are the best at torturing ourselves. We are. We are the best because we have the silent scream. We don't speak up. We couldn't. It was either either you would not be loved or you would be hurt or someone would be hurt. Yeah, it was typically the beatings or the threat that everybody else would would be dire circumstances because if you spoke. Yeah, and you know it's really interesting. Mine was just a, if you were chosen, you were special. So to this day, I have specialitis. I want to be <laughs> Chosen. I want to be special. And I tell people that. I'm like, i got specialitis. So if you think I'm special, I'm going to love it. You're special. <laughs> but, you know, I look at my sister and I shared a room my entire life. And, I, again, I was the youngest. She was just over a year older than me. And I'll tell you, she was not faring well. She, she was – I could just see the demise of my sister through the abuse. And – I remember, it, I was probably about six or seven years old, I consciously thought, I, I don't know how I knew this, but I thought, she is going to die. If sh this keeps happening, she is going to die. And it happened to both of us. I, I watched her. She, I'm sure she, you know, and I would volunteer. I would stand up on the bed and say, pick me. Because I, one, I was protecting her. And two, there was probably a selfish motivation to say, if you pick me, then I'm still special. Right. But, but, you know, to this day, my sister still hasn't fared very well. And you know what I always ask? I'm like, how did I dodge every bullet? I'm, now, don't get me wrong. I don't have, like, oh, I'm so great. And I, have this, I do have a good life. Inside tends to get a little mucky sometimes. But I haven't had a lot of the statistics. And, and my abuse happened numerous times during the week for year after year. It wasn't like a once in a, you know, a, a once occasional thing. It was consistent, numerous perpetrators. So I had gone through, I had gone through the, the grinder for, you know, for years, my entire life. And I always just wonder, how, how did I fare? How did I get to where I am today? And I just have to believe, oh, another thing. <laughs> And I can't, I'm not allowed to tell this story anymore, but I'm going to tell it from teaching. I had grown up believing that God forgot me. Because if there was a God, why in hell would this be happening to me? So I pretty much grew up with the belief that it's me against the world. There's nothing else that is here to help me, save me, carry me through any of this. It was about me fighting the world. And I'll tell you, that's probably been, that's probably been my biggest struggle of all. Well, that's because you have that tough girl persona. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that's how you, that's how, that was your survival mechanism. Yeah. 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 And sports. I'll tell you, oh, I love sports. It kept me going. I, I could thrive at sports. I wasn't that good at school early on. At college I was because I was, I would stay awake till the sun came up because I knew when the, when it was dark, bad things happened. So I'd be up all night long waiting. And then when the bad thing would happen, I'd still wait because I didn't know if there was going to be another series. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's really about how do we, how do we step back into our power when inside there are automatic unconscious triggers that are running us. And I'll tell you, uh, it, they run me sometimes each day. And we have to, it's, it's really important to stay on top of those triggers and those things. And sometimes they can take us by surprise, mm -hmm. uh, no matter how hard we work. But it's recognizing that yeah. there are triggers and there are things to watch for so that when they come upon us, we can jump out of them quicker. Mm -hmm. Because I know for myself, there were times I st I, I'd stay in the, that that. Yeah that mode because 
Well, it was very familiar, for one thing. <laughs> right. And we're damn good at it. We're yeah. really good at it. We know yeah. how to push people away. And I'll tell you, I'm so intuitive. I know, day, you know, days before I know what is going to happen, that, that, was my, that was my survival, is I knew how to prepare myself. And, you know, when it was gonna, I was going to take a blow, I was, I was ready and postured. But it really, you know, so my greatest thing that I, I started to learn and, and my obsession is self-awareness. My obsession is self-awareness. I was just talking to a friend who blew up, like, we had a little tiff. Um, she blew up at me. And, and I, what I said was, here's what I know about me. When you're not sharing your feelings, I know that I feel afraid. And I will start to pursue you to share your feelings because when I, there's mystery, I feel unsafe. When there's knowing and I know what's going on, I feel safe. Mm -hmm. And it's a very key. Now, that's really key for survivors. Survivors, we must protect the perimeter. Mm -hmm. That is something is very important. People will ask you anything about me. They will say, Jane has rules. I have rules. They're really my limits and boundaries because what has to happen is I need to know that life, and not that I need to know everything, but I'm very clear what my limits and boundaries are. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm telling you, I speak up. And you protect. You protect. You have to. You got to watch what's, you know, and it's not that you're hyper vigilant, but you're very clear if someone oversteps a boundary, you're able to say, I'm aware that you've overstepped my boundary. And I'm telling you, it is so important for communication. But for me, is self-awareness is so important. And what happens, and I'll give you, here's the best tip that I can share. It's notice what you're noticing. Notice what you're noticing. If you're noticing, here's a great example. I had, um, I was a, lived in an apartment and a man, actually the maintenance man came into the house or came into the apartment with intent to, I don't know, but he never did anything. And when I put his hand in his pants, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, what I know, after that, four different occasions of some type of voyeuristic perpetrator activities. Well, my attention was focused on victimhood and was focused on that one sexual perpetration. That is, your mind is like a magnet. It will pull every single thing to you. It Here's the it's, it's, it's a, you know, the law of attraction, whatever you want to call it, but our mind is a magnet. Here's the key. I, I could have felt like a victim, like, oh, you know, what are you men doing? I stopped and went, what in me needs to be healed? And why are these, these people are showing up to teach me something about me? So if someone keeps bugging you, you've got to look at what inside of you is being triggered and what needs to be healed. Mm -hmm. But it's notice what you're noticing. If you're noticing outside yourself chaos, then internally you've got some chaos going on. Right. The biggest thing is, I'll tell you, we have just got to be so gentle with ourselves and so nurturing because we, we didn't get the right kind of care. We didn't get the right kind of nurturing. I'm working with a gal whose mother actually abused her. And, and that's rare. I think it's 1% to 2% females are actually perpetrators. And you know, it's a whole other confusing bag of feelings that we get. doesn't matter who, where, what, how many times, or why. It is a matter of self-care and, and being so determined. I'm telling you, so determined. I help people, you know this for a living, I help people speak. I help people find their voice. You do, and you do a great job of it. Thank you. And, it's, and it, I'm telling you, when I see people that I, I see they're shutting down and they're not expressing themselves, man, I just want to go and squeeze all the truth out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's so, it's so beautiful, the words that you've, you've put, because one of the biggest things that I have learned from doing these, this interview series is that I have learned from every single woman that have, has expressed themselves. It doesn't matter where they come from or how far they've come. There's something, there's a nugget of truth that has come from each one of them. Mm -hmm. And as we understand that, the biggest thing is you've got to love yourself. Yeah got to love yourself enough to stand up, speak up, let your voice be heard, and take your power. Yeah. Because otherwise, what's the purpose of life? And I have found that abuse 
is abuse. No mm -hmm. matter what the abuse, it's yeah. still abuse. And you know, one of the ladies I interviewed, um, she had not, it was one very brief encounter when she was a child by a brother. Mm -hmm. And that was it, but it colored her world forever. So there's no measuring stick either. Yeah, and here's what's interesting. I always find it to be, because people would listen, when I did a lot of public speaking around my abuse because I wanted to change. I worked in the school systems. I worked in the community back in the Chicago land area. I mean, I was, I was the voice. I was not going to, to quiet down. And people would come up and they'd say, oh, gosh, you know, you really lived through a lot, and I just had it one time. Here's what's really the mistake that people think. Well, it was just one time. I'm sorry, but that perpetrator has to train you, has to repattern your thinking, your believing, and who you are in order to perpetrate. Mm -hmm. unless, it's a, unless it's a full-out rape, which is a whole different, it's a level, different set of yeah, whole, the whole set of feelings around that. But we, you know, it's like, oh, it was just one time. No. It, it was a gradual manipulation. That you of, didn't see. Yeah. yeah, that you didn't see. And the worst is, you know, when you, like for me, when I'm going through my life and I thought, this is how it is. And when I woke up one day and looked at other people's lives and thought, you didn't have to do this. You didn't have to feel that. And it's so foreign for them to hear my story or my beliefs or actions. And people would be like, I can't even relate. I mean, so it really isn't about the degree. It isn't about how many, how much, how bad, how penetrate. It doesn't matter any of that. Someone can verbally abuse you and have as much effect. That's true. And I also believe, you know, I look at my circumstances. If I didn't live through how much I lived through, I would not be writing the book I'm writing. I would not do the work that I do. So, you know, the greatest, what do they say? The greatest spirits choose the greatest challenges. Well, I chose a whopper. Because I'm probably the one person that can stand up and express myself effectively enough to be able to care and love individuals who have been through this, but also have them get out and stand in their power. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm just thinking about so many different things. Like, um, <laughs> I tell you, any of my partners that I have been with, <laughs> on the intimacy, I'd be like, okay, this is okay. This is not okay. Here's what I need. And, and it was very key, but the biggest thing for me in a relationship, friendship or otherwise, is connected. Mm -hmm. I need to feel that, that soul, that heart connection, because what happens is when we were objectified, we were, we, it, there was no connection. We thought it was. It was a, yeah, we thought it was. We thought it was. I thought, oh, my God, he loves me so much. I'm dad's favorite or whatever. And really what, what now for me, what I crave is I have to be connected. I have to feel a connection. And if I'm not connected. You go I'm, completely the other way. Yep. I'm in a trigger. And I'm telling you, here's a great tip. Write down your list of triggers. Mm -hmm. Write down your, everybody has a list of triggers. Mine and I've, I've repatterned many of mine, but never, ever, ever, I tell people, do not jump out and scare me. I, you will, I will punch your lights. I, will, I, have, I have smacked people. <laughs> and I can't repattern that. Don't jump out and scare me because I will pulverize you. And, you know, write down your triggers. Um, if someone, this is a really, and people, these are the tiniest little things, and they're like, why does that person bug me? You want to make sure, like, if someone comes up behind me with a really slow approach to a touch, oh, I, that, I almost punch them. As you can hear, I'm a little, I'm that fight or flight. The other thing, if, if a man hugs me and picks me up, that's a trigger for me. Don't hug me and pick me up. That is, that feels, you know, condescending. So I know my triggers very much. There's words, there's different things that will trigger me, and I'll tell you, the more aware you are of your triggers, you will, you will stay ahead of your feelings and be able to dictate what you feel. Right. And, and, you know, they happen, and all of a sudden you wake up and you go, oh, man, that's three days. <laughs> that was a long one. I've, I've, gone, I've gone long periods of time where I am triggered, and it's a, it's a really long process. I think my memory started in 1980, had to be 84 or 85. And, and to this day, I'm still, I still get to work on my healing. 
And I believe that's, a, that's an as long as we're human and as long as we're alive, yeah. that's going to be what it is. Yeah, if I stop growing, I, I'm pretty sure I'm six feet under, <laughs> or they cremated me. I, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm done. We're if done. I, if I'm not growing, if I'm not growing and going, I'm I'm dead. Right. And and I think that's you know, it just goes back to the minute you have the idea you had been abused your life changes. The minute you say, oh no, I think this has happened to me. I'm one of three. The minute that happens, your life will never be the same. And there's really good news in that because if we stay in the prison of our victimhood, if we stay in the prison of our silence, we will never fully live as we are here to live. That's right. I love that. Prison of silence, that's what it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we're hostage to our own memories and beliefs. And here's the thing. Nobody's telling us to be quiet anymore. Right. Nobody is telling us. And, and as you know, I do a lot of professional speaking and training. And most every presentation I do, I reference one in three. Because I know if I count that room out, one, two, three, you, one, two, three, you, there are a number of individuals. And it was interesting because I just did one in Colorado. And I said, raise your hand if you know someone who's been sexually abused. Every single person's hand went up. Yeah, and if you watch your audiences, what has been amazing to me is I've been doing my own speaking. Yeah. Even if they don't raise their hand, You're right. you immediately can pick them out. And yeah. it's, it's that look on the face, that something in their expression that totally changes. Yeah. And and, it, yeah. And, and it's just the odds. I mean, the odds are so high, and it's unfortunate. But, but I think it's really about providing what I do is I provide a safe place. I provide a safe place for me and for others to be able to say, you know what, that was me also. And it's so confusing. Like, there's no, there's no real manual that says, okay, this is you. If you've got, you know, diabetes, you're going to do these tests and these things and you'll know exactly where you are. If you've been abused, every individual is, I mean, we can say generally here are some symptoms or here are some byproducts of that, but it truly is about your own individual survivor mechanism that allows you to, you know, we may disassociate, we may endure, we may act out, we may, there's so many different things. But the bottom line is, how do you honor your process now, today? That's so true because I found, you know, what really kind of stirred me is I was in a, a group of amazing people, which I've for years worked to, to surround myself with. And yet, Every time they would decide that they wanted to play games, play games as a group, I would go like, I would just, I'd die. I didn't want to, you know, I just couldn't do it. And I'd have to walk away. And I couldn't understand, you know, hear everybody else laughing and having fun. I was always, what's so funny? You, know? you mean board games? <laughs> no, just, you know, like, um, it not not necess not board games, but more games where they're imitating somebody or charades or different things like that. I just far yeah. far away. I could not do it. Every That's funny. Me too. Laughing and just yeah. having a great time. Oh, no, not me. Yeah, I'm me going. Too. I'm going the other yeah. direction. You know? <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah, it's I, there's so many different things that and and many people we, we you know stay in denial. Many people are like, no, that's just who I am. No, it's not. It's who you've been made. Mm -hmm. It's who you've been made to be. I see so many people in my business and in my life that are living a life that is mediocre or less because of fear. And, and for me, thank God fear was constantly chasing me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be where I am today. Thank, you know, I've changed that. But to get me out of my house safe, to get me through college, to get me through anything in life, I fear was chasing me down and I wanted to keep out running it. And, and the way that I just really took fear is I turned and faced it and thought, you know what? I can't run anymore. I can't run from who I am, from my past, from the truth or my feelings. I need to stand dead center in the middle of them, take them one at a time and deal with them. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the best, the best thing for individuals to do is not, go so deep. Like, I remember I go into therapy and I'd be like, okay, you know, I'd roll up my sleeves and I'd be like, all right, I'm ready to feel the pain. And I'm telling you, I'd be sweating. 
I'd be crying, I'd be, and I paid for this. I mean, I would be miserable, and I would get done, and I'd be like, that was a good session. Because I had re-experienced the same wounding, and it felt like a good session because it was what I was used to. What I was not used to, and this is the philosophy of my book, is don't do what we're used to in our healing. Do what's uncomfortable that says, bottom line is, you are not what happened to you. You are not what they said, and you are not what they did. You are an individual that can stand in your truth. And, and it, that's where it's, it's great to go, okay, I remember these things that happened or not, but to be able to say, now what I prefer is this life. And, and most people stop at the pain and they keep reliving the pain and the war stories. Right. It, it becomes like this broken record. It just keeps going around and going around and going around where you have, in order to finally live and truly live, you've got to break free from it. And you have to decide what is that life going to be. Yeah. And, and I don't want to give this illusion that it's like every day I get up and I'm like, I've got, you know, butterflies and unicorns around me. Yeah. No, every day I wake up and I have to remind myself who I am what I'm doing today, what do I decide and choose to believe? I set my intention because in absence of a destination for my day, in absence of a GPS where I go, I can go to my GPS and say, take me to a happy, prosperous place, and it's going to ask for a destination. Every day I wake up and I ask myself, today, what is it you choose to create? And, and I will, you know, if I'm, yesterday I, I hit a little bump in the road, and I just stopped and I went, what do I need right now? What do I need to soothe myself? Oh, that's a good tip too. Write a self-soothing list because most of us look outside ourselves for soothing. If you love me, then I'm okay. If you hug me, then I'm okay. If you'll give me this or praise or if I'm special, that means I'm worthy. So I'm the best. <laughs> yes, and we've got to write a list of what is self-soothing. What do we do? I was a bathaholic. All I did was take hot baths, lavender, candles, music. And, and that was a good portion of my healing is I, it really helped me. Um, you know, I will, I will do a meditation. I'll do an inner child meditation. I will do a, uh, yesterday I did let go and let God. Because <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> so it's, it's really find how you soothe. And yesterday I hit a hiccup and I'm like, okay, what is best for me right now? You know, we get, we get doing instead of being in our life. And, and we don't know, as survivors, we didn't know how to be because we were told how to be, how to feel, what was true, what was love. And what we, we, were, gonna, we were told just about everything we would do. Mm -hmm. You know, how we'd even feel. Yeah, know? right. Like, I mean, the illusion of this is what we, this is how our relationship, I'm telling you, when I was going through college and just after college, I had a number of relationships that were just a mirror of my childhood. And they had nothing, you know, nothing to do with me. It was based on my role. And, and again, this is, it's not an easy journey. It's not an easy journey. I, can, I was like, you know, scratching and clawing my way through those really hard years. But I'll tell you, it is so worthwhile. But it, it isn't an early easy journey, but it beats the alternative. And the, and the alternative, the alternative, many choose to have that, though. Yeah. Many people choose to have the alternative, and the alternative is I, I, I either leave or I'm left. I either leave myself or someone's going to leave me, or I suffer through abuse. And I worked in every center imaginable from abuse to whatever. And, and it's how do we decide? How do we decide when enough is enough for ourselves? And sometimes it's, you know... I was never addicted to anything, but I had to hit my bottom. Mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to be slapped around one more time to be able to say, I think I need some help. I think I need some help. I had, you know, we just have to really stand in what is our truth. And, and, it's, and I, you know, it's not easy, but I'm going to tell you, every little thing you do to move beyond your old pattern of thinking and believing is so rewarding. It is. It and and, and I, I mean, I am a huge proponent. I remember when I went to, on the Oprah Winfrey show, and everybody was lining up to see her. I hated her at that point. The things she had said, the way she set the audience up, it felt everybody was re-victimized. I mean, everybody was re-victimized. And, man, I hated her. And we were standing in line, and I heard her saying to these, you know, this gal's like, do I need therapy? And she said, well, here, 
I didn't need therapy, but you probably, probably good for you. And I was like, oh, I kept getting more and more aggravated at her. And, you know, it, I believe, because then she had a bit of a breakdown many years later, and boy, she disclosed, she went and got help. And, and I thought, finally, you know, but part of what I, I think is so important is we have to have a structure of support. I mean, we have to have a system and structure of support that says, I know, I know who you are and I see you and now let's create who you would love to be mm -hmm. because that is that part of us is inside our soul seeking to to emerge and all of the truths that we believed are buried are they're just burying the truth of who we are true very true Jane this interview has been spectacular thank you so, thank you. so great. you can tell this is my passion it this is, is my, it's amazing my mission in, in life this story was brought to you by The Woman I Love at www.thewomanilove.com. If you are starting down the path to healing, no matter what stage, our united message is that you are not alone. We do not want to live with a victim mentality. We choose to thrive, and as such, we are joining hands to spread the message that you too can heal and thrive. Will you join us as a force of change we need in our world? Only by healing, growing strong and uniting, can we create the awareness of this terrible epidemic that is plaguing our world. We heal in many different ways. There is no one right way to heal. But the right thing to do is to heal. Heal for yourself, for your families, and for our world. Will you join us in this we choose to thrive revolution. Reach out to us at www.thewomanilove.com. Also check out the incredible resources at www.rainn.org. And if you are actively facing abuse in this moment, do not delay. Seek out help in your local community immediately. Here is to your wellness, healing, and thriving.